New Orleans Saints are now active in regular season play in the National Football League. John Gillen to take on a few of these along the way. Here's that tremendous season. John Gillen runs away from the entire line. The ball is down. Pepsi kicks. It's on the way. That's the way we got to play this football game today. We got to play it because we care. Because you care for each other. Because you care for yourself. Because you care for this football team. And because you care about winning. That's what it's all about. Three, two, one. It's all over. The Saints have won their first game of the year. That shows you how they wanted that win. The Raiders going to keep running to the 40. He tackles there. The Saints have won it. The Saints are winners for the first time in 21 years. He's headed from 47 yards out. In uh, one of the most memorable games in New Orleans Saints history, given the circumstances. Hit by Hartley, and it is. There's John takes a blow. Hell is frozen over. The Saints are on their way to the Super Bowl. This Saints memory special begins by looking back at the Saints careers of three one-time players we lost in 2018. The first of which was likely the most anonymous of the three and that's probably how he'd prefer to play his career. Jim Peterzak was a solid name on special teams. He was born in Michigan in 1953 and later attended Eastern Michigan University where he participated in not just football but wrestling and track as well. His gridiron role was largely handling the long snapping duties on punts and place kicks which would be his mainstay later on in the pros. From 1972 to 73 his other collegiate positions were guard and tackle. In 1973 he earned national honors as part of the Kodak College Division First Team, the Football News First Team College Division All-American Team, and Third Team Small College All-American Selection by the Associated Press. His hard work and quiet determination led him to being the New York Giants sixth round pick in 1974 where he played in every game until he was released on September 20th of 1979 over the Giants needing to fill another position on the roster. New Orleans picked him up on October 5th, 1979 after an injury to previous special team center John Watson and the decision proved to be invaluable in aiding his unit in scoring and field position on punts as part of the Saints first ever non-losing season of 8-8. Eight eight. He was released on September 1st, 1980 but brought back 10 days later when other team members had trouble handling special team snaps in the previous game versus San Francisco. Peter Zak would start seven games total in 1980 and 81 combined over injuries to center John Hill and would be quietly instrumental in snapping the ball for future NFL Hall of Famer Morton Anderson in the Great Dane's first three seasons in New Orleans starting in 1982. The Saints would release Peter Zak again on August 27, 1984 but was brought back on October 8th of that year due to offensive line injuries and he elected to retire on May 8th of 1985 excluding a brief reappearance with the Chiefs during the 1987 strike replacement games. He would reside in New Orleans for many years afterwards before moving to North Carolina. He sadly passed away April 5th of 2018 at the age of 65. A man who quietly did his job where working was its own reward. The Saints offensive line of the 1970s and 80s was also fortunate to have the services of center John Hill. Born in 1950 in New Jersey, a standout player at Lehigh University. Just like Peter Zach, Hill would also be a sixth round draft choice of the New York Giants, though two years earlier, 1972. In three seasons, Hill would start 13 games and play in all but four games for the Blue and White before being put on waivers in 1975, where the Saints would claim him for a waiver fee cost of $100 on September 11th of that year. Largely brought in as insurance with the club scheduled to start an undrafted rookie at center named Sylvester Kroon, 10 days later for the season opener. After the Saints lost that opener 41-3 to Washington, Kroon was released and Hill would go on to start 134 out of 138 games played, 
Early on in his Saints career, he was also special team center. In one stretch, he was so determined to play with a broken finger that he designed his own cast that would allow him to grab the football comfortably. Hill was not just instrumental in leading the offensive line and blocking for quarterback Archie Manning in the club's first non-losing season of 8-8 eight eight in 1979, where the line's nickname was Archie's Bunker, but also led the charge to assist running backs such as Chuck Muncie, Tony Galbraith, and later George Rogers to successful yardage opportunities. I'm just a very fortunate individual. My whole career, virtually injury free. Uh, the luck uh, had it that I had a long career. Archie Manning on second and 15. He's got protection. Throwing. Giants. He got it. Look at it here as Archie goes back. Charles has beaten by, so Archie just kind of lofts the ball up in the air. Watch the reception. In Third down, quick toss, Galbert. He balls in. Uh -huh. Touchdown, New Orleans. Muncie. That's growth in motion. Wilson with a quick draw. Rogers with a tremendous touch. Rogers runs over people. He's still on his feet. Rogers being chased. The 30, 20. George Rogers went coast to coast. Hill would ask for and was granted his release on April the 2nd of 1985, where he would finish his career with the 49ers. While most offensive linemen work as what broadcaster Al Wester called semi-anonymous figures, Hill more than stood out in his day and time without wanting any desire for the spotlight. He passed away on October 21st of 2018 at the age of 68 in his resident state of North Carolina. His legacy will be remembered for the way he played. Solid, unassuming, and selfless to his teammates. You may break to the outside and, and to the opening, and you know that you can't get very much more yardage, but just take on that particular defender and drop that shoulder and make uh, an aggressive play out of it and in a sense try and punish the defender or the tackler and, and you not take the worst of it. A homegrown Saints player that made his professional name on the frozen tundra was Jim Taylor. Born in Baton Rouge, Louisiana in 1935, story goes as a kid he had two paper routes to help earn money for his widowed mother to make ends meet. In his junior and senior seasons at LSU, he would rush for over 1,300 yards and score 20 touchdowns, where head coach Paul Dietzel would later state that Taylor was the best running back he ever saw with the ball under his arm. At one time, Louisiana Governor John McKithen once stated that Taylor was the greatest LSU player he ever saw. He would go on to become a second-round pick by the 1958 Green Bay Packers, where he would rush for over 8,200 yards in nine seasons and 81 touchdowns. And in 1962, was the NFL's leading rusher with 1,474 yards. It was the only time in nine seasons that Jim Brown didn't win the rushing title. Taylor assisted Green Bay in winning four NFL championships, including Super Bowl I, which largely led to his Pro Football Hall of Fame induction in 1976. In 1967, a combination of Taylor wanting to move on and Packers coach Vince Lombardi wanting to retool his team led to an agreement where Taylor was allowed to sign with the expansion New Orleans Saints in return for a first round pick in 1968. On July 6th of that year, Taylor's contract was signed at Governor McKithen's office. Taylor would start every game that season, accumulating 390 rushing yards and 251 receiving yards. Going into the 1968 campaign, head coach Tom Fears didn't feel that Taylor could play anymore. So on the day before September 6th, preseason contest in Shreveport, Louisiana versus the Vikings, he stated that Taylor would be relegated to special teams duty. A further alleged disagreement occurred on the field during warm-ups of that game to where Taylor went back to the locker room and dressed into his street clothes, went back to the team hotel to which four days later he announced his formal retirement as a player. On September 29th, 1968, the Saints would have Jim Taylor Day at Tulane Stadium to honor his NFL career and Taylor would go on to work in various positions for the Saints organization through 1976, including as color analyst for the team's radio network from 1969 through 72. He was also a part owner of an oil field diving company with one-time Green Bay Packers teammates 
Jerry Kramer and Urban Henry for quite a number of years and continued to call Baton Rouge his home until he passed away on October 13th, 2018 at the age of 83. And the, the, the town was just overbear, overbearing with, with support and wanting to come out and see professional football. And it, uh, it was a good year. And I know we played in, in Tulane Stadium and just a, a great uh, to come back home and to, uh, to be with the New Orleans Saints in their uh, initial first year. Taylor had some great moments in Green Bay, but one that he'll never forget happened with the Saints. The opening kickoff of 1967, taken back for a score by John Gilliam. It was just totally deafening. I mean, just the, the ovation and the crowd noise. It was just unbelievable of the, of the sound and the effect of uh, after the, uh, the touchdown, he first touched the ball and, and brought it all the way back for the touchdown. He was a determined player whose drive and work ethic made him a figure of legends, yet down to earth as the common man. With all the emphasis on countless statistics through the decades involving mainstream offensive and defensive numbers, hard to believe but one statistic that wasn't always officially kept was block punts and place kicks. It was often treated as a secondary accomplishment since it didn't happen too often. Furthermore, the definitions of these terms have distinct characteristics. For example, a block field goal or extra point states that as long as the ball is defensively contacted, it doesn't matter if the ball stays behind the line of scrimmage, where it would be live for everyone, or goes past the line, where it is only live for the defense, it is classified as a blocked attempt. However, in the case of a punt, it's another story. A block punt is where after defensive contact, the ball stays behind the line. If the ball goes to or past the line of scrimmage, then it is called a deflected punt. In addition, another term we discovered is a botched attempt, where the opposing team were originally going to kick the football, but because of either a mistake on their part or pressure from the defense, elected not to do so. The rules also gradually evolved when it came to successfully preventing your opponent from kicking the old pigskin. When the Saints first joined the NFL in 1967, Rules allowed for more aggressive means in attacking special teams punters and kickers, including defenders launching themselves into the line of scrimmage. By 1985, the NFL began cutting back on such moves, and over time also prevented any defender from lining up directly over the center in such situations. Through the power of independent research, we've gone through countless film, video, and print articles to find every known Saints defensive block punt, field goal, and extra point along with other attributes on special teams to which we now present some of our results, which include some interesting occurrences. Through the 2017 season, Saints special teams history has featured two interceptions on kicked extra point attempts, which prior to 2015 could be run back for two points. 1977, Ernie Jackson, number 30 versus the Rams had one. And then again in 1981, Tommy Myers, on opening day at Atlanta, thanks to pressure from cornerback Ricky Ray. Once the rules changed to allow defensive turnovers to be run back on PATs, Stephon Anthony became the first NFL player to score two points via this method, thanks to Kevin Williams's block in 2015 versus Carolina. Linebacker James Williams holds the distinction of being the only Saints player to recover a fumble off a botched punt without scoring. Here, thanks to pressure by cornerback Toy Cook at the 49ers in 1991. Another linebacker, James Allen, number 50, is the only known Saints player to score off an interception following a botched punt, which occurred in overtime on opening day 2002 at Tampa Bay, largely thanks to pressure by special teams ace Fred McAfee, number 25. Three times in Saints history, there was a fumble recovery for a touchdown following a botched punt. 
Warren Capone, number 51, got six points thanks to pressure by Ken Bordelon in 1976 against Detroit. Then Brian Jones used his own pressure to score versus Arizona in 1996. Then 11 years later, Pierre Thomas stampeded at Seattle in 2007 off a bad snap for this quick six. Three times in Saints history, a blocked punt resulted in a safety, thanks to Brian Ford at Atlanta in 1989. Robert Massey in 1990 versus Cleveland, he wore number 40. And then in 1972, Joe Owens versus the 49ers. Defensive end Frank Warren holds another club precedent by twice recovering the ball, following a block punt or field goal, and returning it for a touchdown. Here, 1985 versus the 49ers on a field goal that he blocked. And then again in 1991 at San Diego, which followed a Wayne Martin block punt. Saints defensive backs Gene Atkins, number 28, recovering this punt after Johnny Poe blocked it, and Clarence Chapman, each twice recovered a block punt or field goal without scoring. In the category of deflected punts in a career, the leader is Chris Reese with three, twice doing it in the same game at Chicago in 2007. Following him is Mel Mitchell, who had two deflected punts in his career, number 40. And in terms of career block punts, the leader goes to Steve Gleason, who had four in his black and gold career. including one of the most memorable plays in club history. And good evening once again, everybody, from the Louisiana Superdome. This is Jim Henderson. And it would be Saints football right now at the 29-yard line. Three and out for the Falcons and Vic. Here's Kane the pipe. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's there you go. It's going to fall. Yeah, and it, it is up. going to be covered by the Saints for a touchdown. Oh, by Curtis DeRoach in the end zone. Blocked by the Saints. Shades of John Gilliam. What a moment. Just listen to this crowd. It might have been Steve Gleason who blocked it. There was pressure up the middle. They were all over Michael Kanan. And it was rolling into the end zone some three yards deep. And I believe it was Curtis DeLoach who fell on it. Oh, my gosh, what a moment as the Saints break on top just a minute and 30 seconds into this game. John Carter. Safety Doug Wyatt had three blocked punts in his Saints career, putting him in sole second place.
and a tie for third place with Johnny Poe, number 25, and Michael Adams, number 40, each having two in their Saints career. While the Saints' first ever blocked extra point belongs to safety Jimmy Heidel, which occurred in the club's second ever contest versus the Redskins in 67, the all-time club leader in blocked extra points goes to Gene Atkins, number 28, who is credited with three in his career. Tie for second place with two blocked extra points belongs to Elijah Nevitt seen here and Bob Pollard. And finally in blocked field goals, the top three are no strangers to Saints history. In third place is Frank Warren with four. He played with the Saints from 1981 through 1994. A gentleman who played with Warren most of that career span is Jim Wilkes, and he's in Seoul's second place with five career block field goals, number 94. The all-time leader in blocked field goals in the Saints' first 51 seasons is a proud member of the club's first three seasons, that being longtime cornerback and safety Dave Witzel, whose special team's accomplishments include blocking the team's first ever field goal attempt by an opponent in the fourth quarter of the Saints' first ever regular season game, in addition to have blocked three kicks on October 8th 1967 in a contest at the New York Giants. Plus had the club's first ever block punt versus Washington in 1968 that he ran back for a touchdown. However, the Saints were able to one-up Witzel's one-game accomplishment when on December 17, 1972, in a loss to the Green Bay Packers, the club would go on to block four kicks, including being credited for this mistake by Packers punter Ron Whitby, who kicked the ball into the backside of his own blocker, Jim Carter, resulting in defensive end Richard Neal with the surprising touchdown. Other block kicks credited in the contest go to safety Doug Wyatt, rookie linebacker Joe Federspiel, and defensive end Joe Owens in truly one of the most forgotten special teams accomplishments in Saints history. And finally, another club precedent occurred on October 15, 2015, when linebacker Michael Motti blocked a punt and took it in for the score, becoming part of the first father-son combination to block a kick in club history as his father Rich had done so back in 1980 at the Miami Dolphins, the elder Marty being long recognized as a special team coverage great for the black and gold. The men who wore the Saints uniform through the decades like any other team had their share of frustration and accomplishment. Here's to recognizing why this part of special teams is viable, valuable, and in many ways helped the team to be victorious.